Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, let's do some check-ins. Um, I'm 1% nervous. Uh, I am really calm right now and I'm excited. There's like a bubbly, bubbliness uh, coming up of excitement. So welcome to the STOA. I am Peter Limberg, the steward of the STOA. And the STOA is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this moment. And uh, today we're very lucky to have my friend uh, Tomas uh, Bjorkman uh, here today at the STOA. Um, and Tyson will, will uh, formally introduce uh, Tomas, but uh, yeah, I, I view him as the meta-modern whisperer. <laughs> you know, I don't think uh, the whole meta-modern scene would be what it is today without him. Um, he's very instrumental in that. And I think he even coined my favorite uh, word the, the, or phrase, the meta-crisis. I'm pretty sure he, he coined that, and, which is a delicious phrase, and it, it kind of encapsulates so much. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to hand it over to Tyson. Tyson's going to introduce uh, uh, Tomas and then explain how the, today is going to go. So. I'll hand it over to you, my friend. Thank you, Peter. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Tomas, for being here. Tomas is an applied philosopher and a social entrepreneur. He's the co-founder of the Escaret Foundation and the co-initiator of the Emerge Media Platform, which I'm particularly grateful for in this time. And I have come to experience Tomas as a uh, sort of a guide and a trailblazer for the, the golden age community and answering and asking and experimenting under the question of how to create a more conscious society from the ground up. So I'm really appreciative that he's here with us today. He'll be sharing a talk with us. And then afterward, we will open it up to questions. So please answer your questions in the chat below. And then when we get to the question portion, I will call on you to share your question. So Tomas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. And thank you, Tyson, for that, that introduction. And I'm very glad to uh, be on your podcast. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to talk a little bit about uh, uh, metamodernism and talk about uh, uh, where I think that we are in society at, at this point in time. I'm also happy to see a few uh, familiar faces uh, among the participants. So I say hello to, to all of you who, uh, who I know and to all of you who are, I don't yet. Um, so I've been asked to, to speak for perhaps uh, 10, 15 minutes uh, as, an, as an introduction. And um, I want to give you a little bit uh, my personal background and also tell you a little bit of what I'm doing uh, right now. And then also talk about the meta crisis, as Peter mentioned, and uh, where I think we are in this very uh, transformative uh, point of, uh, of human history. So if I, I start a little bit uh, with the, myself and my own uh, background. So uh, I'm Swedish. Uh, I come from uh, a very uh, modest middle class or even, even lower middle class uh, background from an industrial town in Sweden and I was lucky enough to be the first in my family both on my father's and my mother's side to go to university. Uh, I had a talent for mathematics and physics so that's what I studied uh, and I thought that I would become an academic within theoretical uh, physics uh, but for various reasons uh, I come to realize that even though it's a very strong drive for me to try to understand the world. And uh, I have during the last uh, 10 years published uh, uh, three books that I might come back to where I'm trying to analyze and trying to understand where we are in the world right now. So that's a very strong drive I have, but an equally strong drive I uh, discovered was actually to change the world. Uh, to do things, to, uh, to create uh, organizations and ex experiments. So after university, I've actually been a serial entrepreneur and 
started businesses in uh, IT, property, and in banking. I built a banking business in Scandinavia and then in Switzerland, which I sold in uh, 2001. Had to commit to stay as board on the board of directors of the Swiss bank that bought my Scandinavian business for five years and be a chairman uh, of the banking group in, in Sweden. But when that contract ended in 2006, I had the opportunity to think about what to do with the second half of my life. And I decided that I wanted to set up a foundation uh, in Stockholm called the Oak Island Foundation, Ek Skärdet. Uh, and we have our own island outside Stockholm, the Oak Island, where we try to both from a very practical perspective, but also from a theoretical perspective, uh, look into the interrelationship between personal inner development and societal change. And the reason I came up with that 10 years ago was really from my experience in business, starting to uh, realize that um, leadership development consultants in the business world uh, really was onto something when they pointed out that perhaps the most important trait when it comes to uh, uh, recruiting uh, top managers in any organization is really a matter of inner maturation, inner uh, growth. And I also had the opportunity to see firsthand how leadership development programs actually could facilitate this inner development, inner growth, what, what I today might call a, a process of consciousness development. And I was very surprised uh, by the fact that we then, at least in some part of the business world, realize the importance of inner personal development when we are not at all in society or in education or in um, our political um, discourse at all putting any uh, emphasis on this lifelong inner maturation process and the possibility of consciousness development. Uh, I also learned from my years in business the importance of corporate culture. And in the same way, many consultants pointed out to me the importance of getting the corporate culture right. If you get the corporate culture right in a, in a larger organization, then most things will sort themselves out. Whereas if you don't get the corporate culture right, it doesn't matter what new reorganizations or what new manuals you, you issue. And then again, I was surprised that in, in society today, outside the business world, we are not at all talking about culture in that way. We are not talking about societal culture in the same way as we're talking about corporate culture, which of course I think we should. Um, and then I should mention that uh, I'm of course not that naive to believe that we today sh should have, could have, or even should have uh, a monoculture in our society. I think in a more complex society, we really benefit from having many perspectives and having a multicultural society. But a multicultural society, for that to evolve and flourish, we need to have some sort of a meta culture or a holding culture, some holding environment that holds the process of forming a multicultural society just throwing a lot of different cultures in, in, into the bin and, and then expecting them to flourish, that, that is very, very naive. So from my business background, I had this focus on inner development and societal culture. And I was very curious about the connection between uh, these two. To fast forward uh, uh, a few years, five years ago after having uh, had my foundation up and running for, for five years, I started to realize together with my friend uh, and colleague and co-author, uh, Lena Anderson. Lena is a Danish uh, writer and philosopher. And we together started to uh, realize that what I was doing in the foundation was really to 
reinvent the wheel again because without us knowing it and it's not that many people in Scandinavia who actually know the fact that uh, one of the reasons and I could even ask, argue that the most important reason why all of the Nordic countries Denmark, Norway, Sweden certainly managed a hundred or 150 years ago to move from being the uh, poorest non-democratic agrarian societies in, in, in Europe. Sweden was that poor in the late 1800s that up to 30% of the working population actually emigrated mainly to the US to, to get away from, from uh, starving and, and misery. And then just a few generations later, even before the Second World War, all the Nordic countries were in the top list of the most, uh, the richest, uh, the most happy, the most stable industrial democracies in, in the world. And the reason for, for this rapid development or even transformative change in society Lena and I argue in, in our book, the, no the Nordic Secret, um, was the fact that leading intellectuals and politicians in all the Nordic countries actually had a very deep understanding of the importance of inner personal growth and development and societal change. And they also knew that in times of rapid societal transition, and of course, they saw uh, industrialization and urbanization coming, that in those moments in history where you have rapid societal transformation, then it's just so natural for us humans to want to have an outside authority to hold on to, to uh, hold on to a dogmatic religion or to an authoritarian leader. But these intellectuals and politicians, they, they didn't want to be authoritarian leaders. They were firmly committed to building democracy. And they knew that the only way to build democracy is to build it from bottom up. So they wanted to empower what we would call today, perhaps a critical mass of conscious co-creators of modernity. And the interesting thing is how they went about to do that. They actually created what perhaps today best could be described as retreat centers. They created a lot of retreat centers all over Scandinavia. And by the turn of the last century, 1900, there was actually a hundred centers in Denmark alone, 75 in Norway, and 150 in Sweden, where young adults in their early 20s could spend later on with full state subsidy up to six months in retreat with the expressed aim of becoming what we today might call with Professor Robert Keegan's language, self-authoring. Another way of putting it is that you, you you shift your locus of control from being dependent on an, on an external authority, on peer group, on your parents, on your boss, to know the values in your life and your direction in life, to really internalize your locus and control, to connect with your inner compass and be grounded enough to be able to act as conscious co-creators of the new society. And when this program was at its height, almost exactly a hundred years ago, uh, then 10% of each young generation in Scandinavia went through one of these six months uh, retreats. And of course that created some sort of critical mass, some sort of tipping point, especially since these conscious co-creators uh, came from all different layers of society an absolute majority were actually from farming or uh, working class uh, 
background. So I believe that we right now, connecting to the meta crisis, are at a point in the Western civilization at least, where we again are facing a societal transition, a societal transformation. And this time it's not from a pre-modern society into modernity, but rather from modernity via the postmodern deconstruction of modernity into something that we don't know what it is. It is certainly going to be emergent, so we don't know what it is. But if we want to give a name to it, I sometimes use uh, the term uh, the meta-modern society. So going from the pre-modern to the modern via the post-modern to a meta-modern uh, society. And just as the transition from the pre-modern to the modern society actually involved also, not, and not only a societal transformation, but also an inner personal transformation that uh, was necessary for us to be able to hold the more complex, but also more elegant society of modernity, also more free society of modernity. I believe that we today are at the same point where we need to go through inner personal development, perhaps even transformation, in order to be able to co-create and then hold and replicate a more complex, but also more elegant, could even say more loving, uh, meta-modern society. And uh, the story about this transition and how I think that we, through personal inner development, can support that transition, that's the story that I tell in my latest book in uh, The World We Create. So um, I, I think that could, uh, could be uh, a, a framing and I, am, I might speak a little bit more, but that might then be prompted by, by the questions. So I suggest that we op open up the floor. Awesome, thank you. I have um, one question and I see Peter's got a question and questions are coming in. I'm curious about a, a project or a experience, something that has particularly got your curiosity and your excitement right now, uh, that is either a, um, a, a physical place and a project or a social experiment, um, but something that you've, you're, yeah, most, that's most alive to you that you're interested in for doing the inner development that right now is necessary and what you know about them, what you studied and your work in the Nordic Secret in these retreat centers, to what extent were they priming people to like go into the world and do meaningful things? Or to what extent were they purely focused on this is just inner development for the sake of it? Sometimes that's what I wonder about is I'm always doing my inner work through the lens of like how it's going to be applied. And so I'm curious about how you think about that. Okay, so, so first to the question of um, initiatives and experiments. So, so I, th I see myself more as a social entrepreneur than, uh, than a thinker or, uh, or an author. Certainly I have my, my theory of change uh, and I've, I have articulated that in, in my books, but I think that my, my main strength is actually in entrepreneurship. So I have started up myself a few initiatives that I could, could mention. So in, in Stockholm, we have a, what could be described as a conscious co-working space. Uh, where we are bringing organizations together that are working in this area and trying to co-create in this area. Uh, I've taken the initiative to a similar conscious co-working space called the co-creation loft in, in Berlin and also a co-living space in Stockholm where we in, in the very center of Stockholm have 55 people living together in, in one property. Uh, 20 different nations, aged from 23 to 55, I believe at, at the moment, where they are all selected because they are change makers. 
They could be social entrepreneurs, but also just tech entrepreneurs or uh, uh, cultural people, artists wanting to sort of um, influence the world. But also they are committed to the inner developmental journey. So all these people are also committed to working on themselves, but also supporting each other in this process. So I, I think that creating such conscious co-working spaces or co-living spaces could, could be a, a way to um, uh, increase the consciousness and also experiment of different new ways of working and living together. Um, another initiative that I've taken together with a uh, Tech for Good Foundation in Stockholm, the Norsken Foundation, the Northern Lights Foundation. So our two foundations are together since a couple of years working on trying to use uh, a digital platform to support personal inner growth. So we are trying to do the same thing as we are doing on, on our island. And you, many people are doing in retreats. We are trying to replicate that on a digital uh, platform. And the platform is called 29K. That's 29,000. That's the number of days you have in your life if you live a, a long and rich life. And our tagline is make them all matter. And that we are trying on, in this technical platform, we are trying to replicate the sharing circles that are so uh, important in this inner developmental uh, work. And we are trying to replicate that in a uh, virtual environment, just like we are in, in right now. And to our surprise, um, it, has, it has turned out to actually be working at least as well uh, digitally as um, in, in physical space. Uh, and some of our users actually think it is more comfortable to do this type of deep sharing when you are at home in your um, known and comfortable surroundings rather than being in a, in a new uh, unfamiliar place. So we, so we are very lucky there. So I, th I think, as, as I said, we are in an emergent process. I certainly believe that consciousness development, supporting large scale of consciousness development is, is needed. Exactly how we do this, exactly what the odds are when we are at this sort of phase shift or bifurcation point, I don't know. We, we, I can see a lot of things pointing to the, to the dark side. So I certainly believe that we have a huge risk of this phase transition actually being a breakdown in the international system, being a breakdown of our societies. But I also see the possibility of, of the emergence of, of a new civilization. And um, I think that what we can do, apart from working with consciousness development, is just experimenting with new ways of, of being together and working together and uh, then see what is, what is actually working. So in that respect, I see the Nordic secret more as a case study than a blueprint. Um, I don't think we should try to replicate and do the same today on a global basis, but certainly uh, the Nordic secret tells us that a large scale focus on inner development uh, can shift whole countries and has shifted whole, whole countries for, for the better. Thank you. Peter, will you ask your question about the meta crisis? And everyone else, continue to share your questions in the chat. Thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, so I'm. Uh, I appreciate good coinage and uh, I love uh, the term meta crisis, which I believe you coined. Um, so I'm curious, like the, the when and the why of, of, of when, you, when you coined it. And um, if you can maybe like as an elevator pitch, like just unpack what that term means for you. So I, I don't know if I can claim uh, that I, I coined it. I think this term 
has been around in our in our circles for for quite a few uh, years and certainly in 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 one of our my init another initiative that i didn't mention and that is the perspectiva institute in in london we we have been talking about the meta crisis for for quite some years so it it might actually be jonathan rawson uh, at the Perspectiva Institute who mentioned it the first time. I don't remember exactly, uh, but I think I was the first one writing about it and writing about it in, in my book, uh, the, the World We Create and unpacking it a, a little bit. And um, I just think it, it's important that, that, that we recognize that these different crises that we see in the world and that we have seen for many years, like the environmental crisis, the inequality crisis, the psychological ill health crisis, the obesity crisis, uh, uh, all of these different crises, that, that they are not separated from each other. And that it might actually be that all these different crises are just symptoms of an underlying meta crisis. And for me then that meta crisis is really about our present worldview and way of organizing our society, um, going back all the way to the enlightenment. That was the last time when we really shifted our, uh, our way of looking at ourselves and on society and on the world. That new world, that worldview that we got through the Enlightenment has, of course, served humanity very well in many respects. We, we wouldn't want to be without modern medicine and democracy and human rights and, and all of this. But at the same time, I think that that worldview is now reaching the, the, the limits of its capacity and that we need to not leave that way of looking behind totally, but certainly expand uh, on our worldview in, in many ways. And in my book, uh, The World We Create, I point at at least five ways I need, or you know, five directions I think we need to expand our worldview. And just very briefly, it's about realizing that we are not just these isolated individuals maximizing our own utility that the enlightenment philosophers wanted us to believe that we were. Of course, we are in some respects individuals and we should keep our individuality, but we should also realize that we are so totally uh, interconnected and, and interdependent and that we need to keep these both aspects uh, live at the same time. We also need to go into a much, much more uh, uh, systemic and holistic way of looking at the world rather than this linear and analytical way that again through Newtonian physics um, has inspired so much of, of science during the last 200 years and been very very useful but it has to become complemented with a systemic holistic way of, of looking at the world. The next shift is the view of our mind going again from the Enlightenment's philosopher's view of our mind as a rational machine to realizing that our mind is a, an evolving organic system under uh, constant uh, evolution throughout our lives. And then it's waking up to our socially constructed uh, reality. So I think that uh, meta crisis is a key term, consciousness development is a key term, but also our collective imaginary is a key term, our collective imaginary. That is sort of like the water that we, that as fishes we, we, we swim in. We, we have this societal culture that we are and, the, and our worldview and all these hidden assumptions that we just take for granted. And of course, my, my favorite example there is the market that we believe is such a sort of a natural phenomenon when in fact even, even the free market, if there should be such a thing, is a social construct, is something that we as humans have consciously and unconsciously created during the last couple of, of hundred years. And 
we need to start to see these things as human constructs because the moment we start to see the water we swim in we can start to take a responsibility for that water and we can try to to change it but of course the problem there is that to change our collective imaginary we need to do that collectively we can only do so much individually uh, because uh, we need to be we need we are all swimming in the same water and then finally and the last shift in our worldview is really going away from this focus on material growth and uh, utility to really to start to see that we need to focus on uh, meaning and and purpose and that is again a shift from the outside world to uh, to our to our inner world so yeah really good okay we have a lot of juicy questions so i'm going to um, focus on calling on the people that receive like plus ones or upvotes on their questions to continue sourcing the collective here in the best way we can so upvote questions as well that you um want to and then also questions that build on what's being said so um rainy will you ask your question Sure, let me find it. <laughs> so many good questions. On capitalism. Thanks. Yeah, I was, um, you brought up the market and this move um, from modernism in which capitalism's so important. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts about conscious capitalism as a viable platform? Um, I know within that community, there's this sense that if we can be more conscious, more sustainable, good business practices, then that, then, then that will um, sort of save our society from the climate crisis. And then there's other viewpoints that the whole structure is, uh, is unsustainable. And um, there's so many externalities, uh, not to mention a kind of exploitative relationship with things uh, that it's a sort of spiritual materialism to think that just by being good or conscious we can continue living the way we do um, what do you think about conscious capitalism and, and those two perspectives hmm. uh, that, that, that is a very good uh, question and um, one way of addressing it would be to introduce bill sharp's uh, model of the three horizons that we have the first horizon, that's the system where we are today. We have the third horizon, that's the system where we want to be in perhaps 5, 10, 20, 100 years. And then we have the second horizon in between, which might be things that we need to put in place in order to be able to go from the first horizon to, to the third horizon. And I would say that certainly conscious capitalism and, and, and other initiatives like that are very good initiatives in, in the first horizon. That's of course what we could do already today in order to try to make the market and business function a little bit better, a little bit more just, a little bit more regenerative and a bit, little bit more, more um, sustainable. But, and this is my personal experience after working for many years within the banking industry, Within any industry, uh, the market and the market rules puts very severe framing conditions. So if you want to survive and be in business, in any business, being media business, uh, pharmaceutical business, uh, uh, social media platform uh, business or banking business, you have to follow the logic of that industry. You have to follow the logic of the market in that industry. But then of course, that logic is not a natural logic. It is made up by all the constitutive rules in the market. For example, what can be owned, who can own something, uh, what's the function of a corporation and all of these things. So as long as we have the, 
these forces of the industries or the forces of the market working against our consciousness, against our, our, our compassion, against our goodwill, then it's only so much we can do and still survive in the market. We should do it, but there's only so much we can do. So for to really shift business, we need to sh shift the fundamental constraints, the constitutive rules of the market. And my main point is that that can be done. Even more so, I noticed through my years in banking that it is constantly done. So within the banking industry, we were, and are, I presume, even though I left the industry 10 years ago, we were constantly lobbying on the American legislatures and on the EU legislatures to tweak these rules of the market to our benefit, to the benefit of the industry. And that is happening in the banking industry, that's happening in the pharma industry, in the media industry, in the food industry. And my point here was that I was very surprised when I, when I saw this in the banking industry, how, na how many times naive the legislators were when the industry was coming with their uh, very uh, expensive consultancy reports explaining why these new rules should be implemented. But they were paid by the industry and working for the industry. And there were none such job done for the benefit of society. There was nobody arguing, well, these rules might be good for the industry, but they are not good for society. So at least we need to have some sort of balance here. And we, we need to sort of help the legislator understand that these rules that we are constantly implementing and tweaking actually have fundamental effect on how the market is, is clearing and who is benefiting from it and what is profitable and what is even possible to do in, in a certain uh, industry. So to summarize, yes, uh, on the short horizon, conscious capitalism, more enlightened business leader, more, more green and sustainable business is of course perfect, but, but should we have any real change in the uh, economic system, which I think is evident that, that we need to have, then we need to rethink the market uh, from, from, uh, from bottom. The good news is that I think that we have help here in the technological development and specifically when it comes to uh, alternative currencies and cryptocurrencies and things like that. The, the old market is a very crude but efficient instrument when we are sort of projecting all human values down to one dimension, the price. With, with, with cryptocurrency, we can do a much, much more refined system, not projecting everything down to one dimension and thereby keeping more information. So we are sacrificing a lot of information for efficiency. And that is probably the only way we could have done it 200 years ago and 100 years ago, perhaps even 20 years ago. But going forward, we can have more efficient markets, more deeper markets, more, con more conscious markets. Thank you. Thank you. David, will you ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Um, this is inspired by John Verbeke and his idea of wisdom cultivation. So that's the context, but the question is, you know, it's a statement first. The move from external authority to internal authorship is complex and intuition in part seems to be <clears throat> seems to be a kind of thinking from spiritual mind rather than the, from the rational brain mind organizational leadership and democracy seems extended rational thought my intuition is that the next development stage is a different kind of organization and governance more like an organism than a machine and operating from a spiritual mind transcending and including the gut mind, heart mind, and brain mind. Does this inspire thoughts on what individual development and cultivation looks like, wisdom cultivation looks like? Yeah, absolutely. Was that a quote from John Verveke? That's my own. Uh, 
that's my own inspiration listening to John. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I uh, agree hundred percent with 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 what you uh, what you said. So so I, I think that um, um, just just like going from the pre modern world to the modern world was enabled by us really developing our rationalistic way of thinking and knowing. And again, th th that way of thinking and knowing has got tremendous strength and potential, particularly when it comes to understanding the natural world. So I think, again, what we need to do now is that we need to, to develop new ways of, of uh, understanding and knowing. Uh, not, of course, leaving the rational way of, of thinking and, the sci and science behind, but understand that they are very, very strong when it comes to, to uh, uh, natural phenomena. When it comes to social phenomena or even inner world phenomena, then we need to complement that way of, of, of knowing. Certainly with, with uh, intuition, in inspiration. Um, I'm not myself a religious person. Uh, I, I could even sometimes label myself as an atheist. But I certainly think that this direction of inner development uh, is moving us in the same direction as many religions have been trying to move us and is fundamental in, in many spiritual uh, traditions. So in some way, you could say that this crisis, this meta-crisis, which is an existential crisis for humanity, the outcome of that will be dependent on if we can again access some sort of uh, spiritual uh, development. Uh, and, I would even, uh, and I would even say that this concept of consciousness development that we were practicing in, in the Scandinavian countries a hundred years ago, they came from the German, I the idea there of the connection between our personal inner growth and, and societal change and societal growth, that came from the German idealistic philosophers like uh, Goethe, Schiller, Herder, von Humboldt, Hegel. And all of those philosophers, they were really arguing for what we might call a secular spiritual uh, development. Um, and um, uh, as an anecdote, the starting point for Lena's and myself research into the history of, of this development in the Nordic country was that we read a newspaper article from 1889 written by, uh, you, you could even call him the founding father of, uh, uh, of modern Sweden, the, the social democrat Jalmar Branting. Um, he, he was writing, he was 29 years old when he wrote this. He later became the Swedish prime minister uh, three times in the beginning of the 1900s. And he also received the Nobel Prize in Peace Prize for taking initiatives to create the League of Nations after the First World War. But now he was only 29 years old and he was actually in prison. So he was writing from prison. And um, he was in prison, uh, he was condemned for blasphemy because he was an atheist and he was arguing for a secular society. And back then that was enough to, to get you in prison in, in Sweden. But still what he writes there was that, and I, I quote him and I translate him freely now, something like, we social Democrats have been too much focused on the material aspects of life. Of course they are important, but they are only a prerequisite. 
the real important thing is spiritual development. And he's using that word, the Swedish uh, word for spiritual development. He's an atheist, social democrat, but still he says that the, the real important thing is the spiritual development. Yes, we need to take humanity to a new developmental stage. And this language was completely new to Lena and my, myself. Because in, in, in the books of political history in Scandinavia, the workers' movement and, and, and the um, evolution of the modern um, uh, Swe Swedish society was all about material progress. It was about workers' rights. It was about the um, 40 hours work week, the paid uh, holidays, and all of that. In our history books, you don't even mention anything about inner development or, or even less spiritual growth on a large scale in, uh, in society. So of course, Lena and I, we became very, very curious to see where, where this thinking was coming from. And it, it comes from the German philosophers. And they actually had a specific name, a German name that it's not easy to translate into English for this type of development. And they call it Bildung, which is somewhere between formation and realization. It is the natural formation and realization of your consciousness throughout life and the way that that can be facilitated. That is called Bildung. And to come back to the previous question that I now realize that I didn't answer, this Bildung is done for the, for the benefit of the individual, certainly, but mostly for the benefit of society. Because with many people in society having gone through this building journey, you can actually have a societal culture that is more conscious. And once you are able to realize a more conscious culture, that culture can then in turn help people and support people in their consciousness development. So realizing the interdependence between the inner building and the formation of society and how these can form a positive spiral, that is really the idea behind building. And, and that is the concept that was picked up in Scandinavia. And even if I just quoted now the, the, the leading social democrat in, in Sweden, interestingly enough, this concept, this worldview, was embraced both by the socialists, but also more towards the right, the liberals and the, the conservatives. Everyone saw a value in this. You saw different values. On the conservative side, you saw, you saw the value of, of having a rich culture, a richer culture. On the liberal side, you, you saw the value of a, ve a ve well-educated population. And on the more socialist side, you saw this as a very important tool for the emancipation of the working class and for the building of, of, of a new modern democratic uh, society. So this was really a worldview that, that permeated uh, the Nordic countries a hundred years ago. Then you can ask the question, where did all this go? And why have we forgotten it today? And the reason is that we, we change worldview. And that's why I think it's so, so important that we change worldview again, because sometime around the Second World War, and this certainly having being an effect of the fact that Germany lost two world wars, uh, we all in Scandinavia uh, turned our focus away from Germany, from uh, the, the Germanic philosophers. German stopped being the academic language in Sweden. It was the academic language in Sweden up until the Second World War. And we went to, to English and we turned our focus towards the Anglo-Saxon world, towards Oxford and Cambridge. And what did we find there? Well, we find the Enlightenment philosophy. We find Locke and, and Descartes and uh, analytical philosophy all being in this rationalistic mind. Uh, and we switch to a positivistic view of the world where only what is measurable counts. 
and anything of the inner world is subjective and, and therefore not really worth uh, uh, our attention. So yes, we, we completely lost this focus and we now I can understand why our history books do not even mention this because from, from our worldview today, consciousness development doesn't make sense. We again believe that our mind is a rational machine that should just be functioning. And if it's not functioning, we should take some pills or go to therapy, go in therapy to make it work again. And this sort of huge developmental potential th that we used to see in Scandinavia, th that, that is all forgotten. And again now, yeah, and, and again, just to tie it all up to what we are doing, what we are doing now. And in this societal transition that we, I believe that the meta crisis today is pointing out clearly to, to us that we need to transition into something completely new, their consciousness and consciousness development again will be a key understanding. And it's, it's gonna be again, our ability to help a lot of people in many different positions in society to uh, grow uh, in consciousness that, that will help us to uh, see uh, a more meta, a meta modern world emerge. Thank you. Nicholas, will you ask your question? Sure, let me find it. Um, right. Uh, thank, thank you, Thomas, first of all. Thank you. So you had, you had uh, started off the talk by mentioning that achieving a meta-modern view uh, comes after uh, a modernist view, but by means of, or by way of the postmodern view. And I don't know if you're familiar with uh, David Chapman, who contends, um, I guess, the opposite. He, he says that uh, uh, the postmodern view tends to destroy the, the, an understanding of uh, a, a, syst like a, a systematic, rational understanding of the self. It destroys that, that uh, systematicity uh, without pro proposing any other alternative. And he suggests that, that, that non-humanities educated graduates, so people who, who didn't study STEM, are, um, uh, find it much more difficult to shift from, from a systematic view, a Keegan level stage four to a stage five. Uh, whereas those with a STEM education who haven't had that postmodern Kind of acid bath of of uh, de deconstruction are much better suited to achieving a better modern view. So, um, what are your thoughts about that? Are, are you familiar with that? No, no, and, and I think he he's he's absolutely um, absolutely right. In in many ways, uh, uh, the postmodern uh, uh, philosophy and and thinking is, is in my opinion, uh, a, a dead end. But it has certainly helped us to, to see the limitations of our modernistic way of thinking. And it has pointed out many important realizations. For, for example, the fact that our world uh, is socially constructed. Before the postmodern philosophers, we, we took the water for given. And the postmodern philosophers are really pointing the finger to the water. So the postmodern philosopher helps us see the water. The problem is exactly as you, you pointed out, um, the postmodern thinking very, very easily ends up in a relativistic thinking. We realize that all meta narratives are human made and therefore they conclude wrongly that they are all arbitrary and worthless. No, we as humans, we need our symbolic universe. We, we need our meta narratives. Yes, we will never, or no, we will never find the na meta narrative out there. We will not find it in God or in a religion. We will not find it in science and we will not find it in the market. So I argue in my book, The World We Create, that, that all of these sort of meta narratives and these ultimate authorities in the meta narratives like God, science and the market, when we realize that they are human constructs, 
we, we can either be completely uh, relativistic and just give up hope, or we can make the metamodern move and say, well, then we need as humans to take responsibility for our socially constructed world. We need to take responsibility for our meta narratives and we need to take responsibility for our ultimate authorities. We need all of these, but we see now that they are human constructs and we need to take responsibility for them. So, uh, and here I, I agree totally with the, with the in integral uh, way of thinking, with Ken Wilber's way of thinking when it comes to that the next way of seeing the world has to integrate uh, the best components of the pre-modern way of thinking. We were even, we were just talking about the spiritual way of thinking, perhaps even uh, the prehistorical way of seeing the world, indigenous or uh, archaic way of looking at the world. Certainly the pre-modern ways of looking at the world, the best of modernity, the best of reason, the best of science, and then the best insights of the postmodern philosophy, and then integrate that into some sort of integral or ho holistic way of, of, of seeing the world. So yes, the, the, the postmodern way of seeing the world is, is a curse right now, but, but has got gold within it, and we shouldn't just throw it out. We should take the gold and uh, integrate that with, uh, uh, the previous ways of, of seeing the world. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, that brings us two minutes to the hour. Do we have a uh, time or an opportunity for another question, Tomas? Yes, for me, absolutely. Cool. All right, Peter, that's cool. All right, let's see. Um, Steve, will you ask your question? Hey Thomas, there's about a thousand questions coming up now after uh, after your great talk. Um, so Thank I'll you. try and remember it. But so what what's coming up for me is the um, I'm really curious about the emergent potentials of these um, what were physical retreats, and I'm curious if those retreats you said they were, had emergent potentials were they just. Um, created and they kind of went away and did their own thing or was there kind of some structure or container or riverbanks mm. put in those um retreats and then you know it's bringing me to to now where we've got all these so-called digital campfires and there seems like such an emergent potential between the meetings of these different um campfires and what could come in them in the polarity between people with different uh, opinions mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I, um, when I hear your question, I also realize that uh, I left another aspect of a previous question unanswered. And, and that was, uh, w were these retreats just personal development retreats or what, what were there more aspects to them? And, and I think I answered that by saying that uh, th the idea behind was certainly personal development for uh, societal development, but I I forgot to 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 say that certainly uh, in these retreats, yes, personal development was one major aspect, but then also, and so was also um, actually learning about the emergent technology and the emergent society, and and giving the participants a feeling for that the new technology that is coming is actually up for shaping and it could be shaped for, for good. So today that would be actually understanding a bit about artificial intelligence, machine learning, other, other things sort of. So yeah, so there was a component there of, of trying to embrace and understand that we as humans can use technology for good and for bad. And it's up to us to understand technology and to use it. So that was one aspect. But then the third aspect, um, which was also very, very important, and, and that was giving these young adults uh, really the tools to act in civic, in, in civic society. So they were actually uh, taught a bit how to set up a, 
uh, a small NGO, how to start a newspaper, how to write an article, how to argue for, for your case. So today that, that would have perhaps, that could perhaps today translate into uh, how do you start a YouTube channel? How do you write a blog? How do you get your ideas uh, out there? So uh, yeah, it was personal development, but also get preparing and giving the tools to become active uh, co-creators. Co mm -hmm. So I don't know if that answers a bit your question there, Steve. It answers some of it, yeah, and I love it. I'm just pinging from the link to the Rosa Parks story that's in your one of your great talks. I think that's fantastic. Uh, connection. Um, yeah, we, 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 we have on, on the cover here a picture of, of Rosa Parks together with Goethe and Schiller, and that's a bit of a, of a, of a cliffhanger. So why, why do we have Rosa Parks on on, on the cover. There is a connection to the USA, which also, I believe that you, you will have David Brooks on uh, the STOA later this week, uh, Peter, is that the case? Sorry, uh, I missed that something was uh, glitching. Yes, my yeah, uh, I, was, uh, I, I believe you will have David Brooks on the STOA later this week. Uh, no, we have uh, Michael Brooks uh, later on today. Aha, uh -huh, okay, I thought it was David Brooks. Okay, yeah. the, the, but I will reach York, out to David Brooks. <laughs> yeah, the, the, uh, the New York Times uh, columnist. The reason why I mentioned uh, him was that, that uh, he wrote uh, uh, an um, opinion piece in the New York Times two months ago uh, around the, the Nordic secret. And he also pointed that to the connection to uh, uh, to the US and how Rosa Parks has said in many interviews that what gave her uh, the moral inner compass to know that even if the law of the land said that she should give up that seat on the bus in Alabama to that white person, that she had the moral right to remain seated, was the fact that she actually had participated in uh, this type of Scandinavian retreats and that and in the US. So this concept actually traveled from Denmark where a guy called Miles Horton in the 20s spent a year to learn this concept. And then he started four uh, centers in the US, the uh, Highlander Folk School in Tennessee being the most uh, well known of them. And these centers played a, a very important role in the civil rights movement in, in the US. So that's the connection to, to Rosa Parks and to, and to the US. So uh, yeah, so the, 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 the building of the, the Nordic uh, modern democracies, the civil rights movement, there is something in this uh, concept that I think we should, uh, again, not, not use as a blueprint, but uh, have as inspiration for what we need right now in the world. Well, it's certainly been inspiration to me. I really appreciate you, Tomas, for being here and taking these questions. We've got many <laughs> great observations and questions uh, coming through, so this is, sparking, uh, it seems, a lot of insight and curiosity. So thank you very much. It's, it's, it's been a pleasure, true pleasure. Thank you. Good. Um, Peter, do you have anything that you want to share? Yeah, I will uh, uh, close up with some uh, uh, announcements of upcoming events. But uh, first, uh, Tomas, thank you so much, my friend, for coming to the STOA. Okay. Thanks for everyone with your excellent questions and Tyson for being an excellent MC today. Um, so yeah, today we have an uh, event at 2 p.m. Eastern time with Michael Brooks from the Michael Brooks Show um, against the web. Uh, <clears throat> it's called Against the Web, where he criticizes the sort of the right wing movement and the, the culture war. Uh, and tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time, we have Unasked Questions with Nora Bateson, which is going to be really cool. And then on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern time, we have uh, Radical Honesty During a Pandemic with uh, the self-help author Brad Blanton, which be, should be really cool as well. So you can just RSVP on the, the website, uh, thestoa.ca. 
And the STOA is based off the gift economy. Um, it's viewed as a gift for us to freely use in this time of need. If you're inspired to give a gift to the STOA, just go to thestoa.ca slash gift for more information. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you all.